everybody. We're super excited to be back here in 2017, and boy, have we have so much planned this year for you guys, uh, just in terms of how much we're going to be doing in uh, regards to education for our CRPs, our component relations professionals. Uh, today is an extremely special webinar uh, to me, but also I think to all of you, as we've been learning more and more about your, your challenges uh, to grow your associations and to create healthier organizations that have chapters or divisions and sections. Today is the, by far one of the most widely requested topics for us to touch on. And uh, I'm super excited to, to share the story uh, from, uh, from our guest speaker today in terms of what they have done and um, you know, where they're, what, what happened then, the, the pros and cons, uh, the good, the bad, and I think what's great about it is we're a couple of years removed from the decision. So where are they at now? Um, so I hope everyone is ready to, to learn. Uh, we got a, a lot of really awesome content to share with you today. Okay, it looks like I'm getting some good answers that everyone can hear us loud and clear. Uh, Diana, uh, great to see you in here today. Uh, I just saw you, you uh, chat right in. Um, awesome. All right, so if everyone could see my screen, if everyone can hear me clearly, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So today, uh, uh, our theme, our topic, is rowing the same direction. So how the Association of Corporate Growth has aligned global, which is their HQ, so HQ and their chapters, all right? So as always, I'd like to talk about our learning objectives. Uh, today's learning objectives uh, is going to be to summarize the challenges. So what we're going to be talking about today is not, a, uh, not an easy topic and probably a, sometimes a heated one between the different parties that you're managing. But summarizing the challenges so we can address those. Identify key resources. So if you're a note taker, make sure to get your pen and pencil uh, ready, um, or if you're taking notes on Evernote or whatever, uh, because uh, Gary's gonna be sharing a lot of these key resources that they used. Also listing uh, key technology. I think that's so important to talk about when it comes to this topic. And then describe capacity building, something Gary's gonna teach us. And then outlining next steps. So one of our goals at Build Highway uh, throughout this education is we don't want to just give you information. We want to outline those next steps for you and actually give you applications uh, based off of our webinars. So get ready for that, okay? Well, without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Gary LeBranch here. He is a FASAE as well as a CAE. And he is the president and CEO of Association for Corporate Growth since 2008. So, Gary, thanks so much for, for spending time with us today. It's a pleasure to be here with you, uh, Kyle, and uh, good morning to everyone, and Happy New Year to everyone. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And so, Gary, um, I'll, I'll let you speak to it a little, little bit, but just kind of, you've been, you've been around the association world for quite some time. Um, kind of walk us through um, your, your history and, and how you got to where you're at right now. Well, I, I started in this business right after the invention of movable typeface back in the 1600s, and uh, it's been a long, long journey ever since. Well, I, I've been, uh, I, I got into the association business right out of uh, college, uh, right after I graduated from The Ohio State University, and decided to become an association executive while I was going to school, and uh, been in it uh, ever since, and had the um, pleasure to work with a number of different organizations, and at, I was uh, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce as, as its association uh, uh, liaison to the, the association community and the Committee 100, and uh, then I worked for ASAE for a number of years. I was uh, the vice president of uh, pub, uh, professional development where I ran all of ASAE's uh, uh, meetings, conventions, expositions, certification program, fellows program, et cetera. Uh, so I was there and then became CEO of uh, Association Forum of Chicagoland, the association of all the association professionals here in Chicago. And, uh, and then uh, I was recruited away uh, and came here eight and a half years ago, right at the very beginning of uh, the, uh, the Great Recession. And so joining a financial services organization at the beginning of the Great Recession, perfect timing on my, my part. So I've uh, been here ever since, and it's been, been, a, been a blast. Great. And, I, and I'm Kyle Bassey, for, for those of you who don't know, Director of Growth here at Bill Highway. I always like to share I'm a proud Detroiter. You know, people, I like to share just how much 
um, history our guests have on this webinar because I think it's important when you're listening to them to know that this isn't just some newbie that's coming in uh, to teach you something. Uh, Gary's been around for, for probably seen a lot over the last 36 years and, and that's what we want to share with you today. Um, so Gary and I kind of talked before the webinar today. I'm going to do a little bit of play-by-play -play and, and have uh, Gary add in his color from the presentation we made with him. But we just sent these questions out to you earlier this morning, so if you didn't get a chance to reply by email, I'd love for you to, to, to chat uh, into the, the chat feature on GoToWebinar for us. And the questions I want you to answer for us are, why do you feel your chapters are not aligned? I think you know when I say chapters, that could be your states, your divisions, your sections. But why do you feel at your organization they're not aligned? Is this something you're looking to solve in 2018? Or is this, this something you think that the organization is looking to, to work on? And what have you done up to this point? And I'll add one more. What do you need help with? Because I want to make sure we're tailoring all of the amazing um, the resource we have here in Gary in the next hour um, to make sure we, we touch on that. Okay. So as you guys are all typing into the chat for us, um, and, and please, any other feedback you have, let us know. Uh, Gary, we, we uh, were talking to you the other day as we were preparing for the webinar, and this was a quote that you had said, um, or maybe even written, that we extrapolated. Uh, and I, I want to talk to you about it. It says, a chapter in isolation is much less likely to appreciate the value of being part of the system. So obviously this is kind of our general theme today, but just talk to us real quick to get us started. Um, uh, you know, ACG obviously has chapters, and we're going to go into that structure in a second, but, um, you know, what do you see as uh, some of the major issues around the association industry when it comes to chapters and around this isolation concept? Well, um, thanks for quoting me. Uh, very few people ever do, so I um, <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, you know, I I'm a believer in the association model, and uh, I'm an advocate for the association model. And the association model, broadly speaking, is is based on the idea that you know we get people together to share uh, knowledge and uh, learn best practices and you know learn from each other. And I think the same principle applies when we're talking organizational systems or components. Um, and one of the first things I, I, I and uh, Leslie Widdett and our team here at ACG recognized when, when we sort of started the, all of this eight and a half years ago was, you know, if, if, if the chapter leadership and chapter staff are, feel like they're on their own uh, and they don't, uh, they don't have an appreciation for what the whole group can provide to them, then they're isolated and that forces them to constantly invent things and come up with solutions that have already been solved and provided by others. And, um, you know, the, they don't appreciate the leveraging power, the, the multiplier uh, effect um, that the whole group can help them, uh, uh, can, can provide for them. And it's a, it's a powerful thing when we do work together, when we're in the same boat and we are rowing in the same direction. But if you're if you don't appreciate that, if you don't have any sense of that, then you know there is this sense of isolation, and the world's um, world's against you sometimes. So yeah, absolutely. So let, to get us started too, and it's something that we've been talking a lot with our um, the people we've been educating is uh, we're going to talk about challenges right now. But uh, what is the the ACG's structure? Um, are you is it affiliates? Is it federated? Um, and then kind of talk, is it states and local chapters, or how are you guys set up? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Always, uh, you know, always begin these things by giving context, you know. Uh, ACG's been around as an organization since 1954, um, and it was created as and existed as a chapter-centric organization from the get-go. Uh, and in reality, it, the global, as we call it now, or the headquarters operation, was very deliberately kept um, small, weak, and uh, under-resourced. And so um, uh, uh, we are actually, I, I actually am only the uh, second full-time CEO in the organization's history at the global level, uh, and by far the longest serving, and I've been here eight and a half years. Um, so the organization is uh, a chapter, uh, every chapter is independently incorporated. 
um, and they they are they relate to the global organization through a chapter affiliation agreement, which is a licensing kind of agreement. Um, and then, as you'll as you'll we'll talk later on, there are lots of linkages though. The, the chapter affiliation agreement basically says that you know global has to collect the dues and rebate our, their the chapter's portion to them. Uh, and we have a number of other things that we do, uh, websites, etc. Um, so we're we're seeing the global as sort of the service bureau to empower and serve the chapters, and chapters very much in ACG are the front line um, pr service providers to our members and and our community. Um, and for a large part, um, most members don't even know that we e e exist, and so um, so that's a that's a piece of our context. And then the governance of our board, which is a 27 member board. Uh, is dominated by people who are currently or recently past presidents of chapters, uh, or and virtually all of them have been on uh, their boards, uh, and uh, the majority of the board seats are directly appointed on a rotating basis by the uh, by the chapters, and so cha it is a chapter centric organization that is really controlled by the chapters. Awesome. And so we're, let's talk about some challenges, and we're going to set the stage here for everybody. But I already see several people coming in with, with their challenges, and, and um, it, we're going to see that they're very aligned here. Uh, and folks, I just want to make one point. Usually when we bring you someone to this webinar, it's someone that's usually a CRP. Um, today it's, it's the CEO, and so ask the questions away. I talked to Gary before to make sure it's okay with him. Um, I know one of your obstacles is framing up the story to tell to your senior leadership, and how do you get buy-in from them um, on something like this? So ask away on those questions. Gary's Gary's definitely here to, to help. Um, and so, in the in the theme of me doing the play-by-play, -play, um, we're going to talk through some challenges right now. So, uh, Gary, maybe set the stage for us. Um, you you at some point had a strategic goal to make a change and get the chapters more aligned. Um, when was that? What what year was that? Well, the uh, the association itself um, was uh, undergoing a period of, of rapid change, the growth of membership, um, going from a very relatively small organization to a relatively large organization fairly quickly. Uh, and the organization, um, because the national, the global organization, was very weak and understaffed, it was... Um, it was managed by a small association management company um, that was literally still operating by fax uh, in you know the early 2000s, um, that sort of thing. Um, so the uh, organization was literally uh, growing 10% or more a year, um, and uh, the, the the chapters, while they were doing all the programming, needed services that um, the global organization wasn't and couldn't provide. And at the same time, at, the, at that time, the, the sort of the global organization, uh, very ineffective uh, management and, and systems, technology, et cetera. Um, the board itself was very operational. You know, they, the, the convention chair literally managed the convention, decided what uh, liquor to, to put on the, board, uh, on the bar, you know, literally picked the, the tablecloths and, you know, literally uh, operated it. Um, you know, um, and then um, uh, and it, it didn't turn over. It was sort of clubby, institutionalized, not really connected to the organization. Um, then the, we had the system of chapters, and it's a federated system, so the chapters were very autonomous. Um, we had at the time, I think, 42, 43 chapters, and there were 42 or 43 mission statements. Nobody had the same mission statement. Um, the organization, the global organization, had a 56-word mission statement, so nobody could ever remember what the heck the mission statement was. So everything was sort of all over the board, and because there was sort of no connectivity, uh, really significant connectivity or services, um, it, it was it was a very loosely organized uh, uh, system. Um, and then, frankly, to make things w worse, um, the 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 leadership of the global organization. Uh, decided to make a change in roughly 2005 or so after a period of, um, you know, they, we call it the Civil War, after a period of real uh, uh, 
conflict within the organization because of this the, the rapid growth coupled with the organization's inability to serve the organization. And so a lot of conflict happened, came to a place where they said, all right, we've got to change. We need to have a stronger uh, global organization. We need to have professional staffing. We need to better serve our chapters. Um, and um, uh, and, and uh, a little bit before I came in, they started to do that. Um, there was a, uh, a CEO that they brought in. Uh, he left a couple of years later. So um, then they sort of started to rebuild it again. And uh, the first thing they did right was uh, uh, go get their financial uh, organization set so that they, we could actually have a financial statement and whatnot. And then they, uh, then they hired Leslie Wittett. CAE, who um, had been chapter uh, executive of uh, one of our most successful and largest chapters, and she agreed to come in as uh, vice president for chapter operations. And she's still with us uh, here at, at ACG Global, and she really has been the, the leader of um, this uh, uh, journey with our chapters. And it's not completed yet, it's, it's a journey. So Leslie and her team have been the, the critical part of this whole or, uh, operation. And then, um, and then I came along a couple of months later in September of 08. Wow, great. And, and uh, I just want to let you, we're getting some really great comments right now. And Olivia just said, we currently have a federation structure, and Gary is hitting on all sim cylinders regarding challenges. Um, <laughs> it's probably the most difficult um, form in the association model, you know, the, the, the federative structure where um, the organization, you know, as I, as I say early on, I realized very quickly that I had literally no power, literally no power. I couldn't tell chapters to do anything. I couldn't uh, uh, command them. I, I, you know, they because they had had a bad relationship with the global organization, that they were not inclined to do anything that we asked them to do. They were distrustful of us. And again, you can't force them. So, um, and Leslie and, and I realized you know, early on, um, our job was to uh, joyfully and, and uh, um, happily serve them and empower them to our chapters and their chapters to, to do um, to do a great job of serving our members. So that's kind of that was our aha moment, you know. Awesome. Yeah, and it starts with serving the members. So uh, I feel like sometimes it's a it's a Dr. Phil episode here uh, for our <laughs> webinars because it's all, all, it's incredible. It really is incredible how many associations uh, the people on this webinar today have similar challenges in um, and and so let, let's start going over. I think the important question. All right, Gary. Well, what did you do? Um, so the first thing we want to tackle today is your technology infrastructure, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we got some bullet points here when you're looking at it. You made a hefty investment into technology. Uh, at what point did you guys get to that conclusion? And talk us through what went right, what were the challenges, and how is it going? Okay. Well, first of all, let me uh, say that uh, as we go through these things, and there's like three or four bullet uh, er areas that we're going to talk about, th they're, they're not necessarily meant to be sequential. In other words, oh, we did this, and then we did that. Um, you know, it was more, uh, these things were done in parallel. So I just want to make sure we put that in, uh, in context. Um, you know, and, and, and we're going to be summarizing. So we're not actually going to be able to get into every little thing we did. So we kind of picked the things that I thought made the biggest um, uh, impacts in the whole relationship. And certainly technology was one. Uh, and, and this was a decision that was made prior to my coming aboard. Leslie had been engaged in this, uh, but it was very much driven by the demands and the needs of, of the time. You know, you can imagine, you know, the worst situation is when you have your chapters literally all out there doing their own thing on the web, uh, on the internet. And so, um, and there was no centralized way to communicate and, 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 uh, and have a feeling of that the organization was a holistic organization. So uh, it, was a, it was a smart thing to do to create this global platform. Uh, a, a lot of the idea behind this was cohesive branding, look and feel for the organization, showing that it is a united organization, and then also serving the members with a, with a way for members to 
find each other, connect to each other. You know, at the heart of the ACG value proposition is the, abis the ability to connect with each other to do business. 75% of our members say that that's what they do is they, work, they do business with other members and they buy and sell companies. They're investment bankers and private equity and strategic buyers of middle market companies and, and then people who serve them, the lawyers and accountants, etc. So connecting with each other, the networking uh, aspect is the central value proposition and so a common web platform was critical to meeting that need. So we did that. Um, uh, it's not, and it's uh, it. It, it, w it was also built in with community and all that kind of stuff, which was fairly forward-looking at at the time. Um, that launched in uh, February of '09, and then there were additional investments, uh, making it better and better. And now. Um, you know, it's, it's so funny, you look back at our current website and you go, oh my god, it's awful. Well, it, it, it's awful because within two years of the launch of the website, you know, we had the revolution of um, mobile uh, technology and suddenly, you know, people aren't connecting to their to the website on, on their desktop anymore, they're connecting to it on their phones and their uh, iPads and whatnot. So we're now... Uh, uh, launching a new web platform actually this quarter and that's about another million dollar uh, investment so um, and there's another piece of this you know we also helped co to coordinate uh, and make available the chapter events calendar uh, our chapters do about 1100 events a year again the purpose is to connect with each other network um, and so having a master events uh, calendar allowed our members to then experience uh, the organization across the country and across the world so when they visit um, you know they go on business trips they look and see well you know what's the ACG chapter they're doing and they they attend events so um, that was a critical part of frankly knitting the organization together in a cohesive way so, um, and this is great, Gary, and people keep asking your questions. If I don't get to them right away, we'll get to them at the end. So um, uh, we're going to talk about what that platform was in just a second. But what kind of challenges came with this when you had getting the chapters on board, especially in a federated model? Did you incentivize them? Um, how did you accomplish such a feat with the technology to get everyone using or, you know, uh, for the most part um, on a lot of these key ones, get them using the same systems? Well, um, not everybody um, was on board with that at the beginning, but a, a great many were uh, because they wanted to have access to the member directory and they wanted to have access to um, uh, the, the other features. We, we, we built in uh, uh, other services, but one of the we call Capital Lake, it's Link, it's a, it's a third party provided um, uh, database, if you will, that's very, very powerful and important to doing business in, in this industry. And so those are the kinds of things we sort of put in there uh, as, as, along with the, the calendar system and the ability to register online for your own chapter events and to, for other chapter events. Um, so there was a, there was a lot of um, uh, business reasons uh, for chapters to, to participate in this, a lot of benefit uh, for them to do so. Um, but, you know, at first there were a few skeptics, a few, you know, chapters that, oh, you know, we're going to do our own thing. And again, we can't make them. Um, and so we had to um, make it attractive for them to voluntarily participate. And what that required, frankly, was a lot of listening and adapting to what their needs were. And Leslie and her team were uh, and are terrific at doing that. Awesome. Yeah, and so everyone, if you're taking notes, write that down, is find out what is attractive for them to adopt. Even if it's, even if it's not voluntary and you can mandate some of it, you still want to find what is attractive to them. So Gary, the technology infrastructure you just talked about with that investment, uh, the AMS, as we understand it, is the Abilinet Forum. Um, Walk us through how did you like that, you know, what did they handle, um, and, and how, what's the experience been like with you guys for this, uh, for everyone else looking maybe for an AMS with chapters. 
Uh, at, at first, uh, when uh, when we first uh, started this, we actually um, were on a different system. Uh, it was sort of a, a, a the legacy system, if you will, and it and it was it was okay, but it was it was it was did not have all the features and functions that that you know our chapters needed and our members uh, needed. Um, and so after we got the website up and running and did a, did a few iterations of that, uh, we were then able to attack the um, AMS and you know uh, this this was my fourth AMS uh, and you know hopefully my last AMS uh, you know they're they're not easy projects anybody who's ever done one will tell you that they're very very difficult uh, this you know it, it, you know the selection and the the development and the implementation not easy um, a that forum has been terrific for us uh, you, you know it's um, it is the backbone of our of our whole organization and um, it, again it, it's a been about a million dollar investment for us it provides a, the ability for uh, all of our chapters to you know collect store analyze data the reporting is terrific we've now created I don't know, upwards of 50 plus to 70 plus um, common queries and reports that our chapter executives have have, have asked for. Uh, we have about 130 or so uh, chapter staff uh, in the field, and so both with the website and with the AMS, the the critical challenge, frankly, other than building those and you know troubleshooting those. Uh, and securing those uh, is training because we have all these staff members who were at um, various levels of technical competency um, and uh, when we first started back in 09 with the website um, uh, some of our longest serving chapter executives frankly you know were not up to the challenge of working and in, in, in using a, a website um, and so they either uh, parted company with us, or um, it, or they hired staff to to work those things. And the same was certainly true with the AMS. So we did a lot of training and development with our chapter staff, uh, creating standard operating procedures, um, constantly retraining, um, uh, you know, providing uh, expertise here. Uh, at the global office, and you know, we about a third, uh, twenty percent, I should say, twenty percent of our chapter staff or so turn over every year, and so there's constant uh, retraining uh, and, and bring, bringing those people up to speed. But the benefits are huge, you know, being able to really identify, you know, who's engaged with us. In fact, we create an engagement score for every single member uh, based on an algorithm algorithm that we developed. Um, and so it's uh, you know it, it was uh, it, it was a challenge, but it's it provides us with um, a 21st century management system uh, that gives us great visibility to what's going on and uh, and how we can better serve our members. So I know a couple of people that I saw in the webinar today are actually in the process of looking for an AMS. So if you were to sum it up, Gary, and I think there's a, a song that says, "If I knew." What I know now, back when I was younger, uh, what are what would be two you know main things to concentrate on that are going to add tremendous value when it comes to an AMS w when people have chapters? Well, I'd start by getting a good therapist. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's somebody that you can vent to and and talk about these. It's not easy, you know. I I don't want to sugarcoat it. It is not easy. It's not necessarily fun. It's kind of grinding. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, you're going to have a database, and so it's not like you know you're building a bridge and you go, oh, wow, this is awesome. Look what we did, you know. So it's um, it, it's I can't say that it's thankless, um, but it's it, you've got to steel yourself and have the resolve to to work through the project and so when the first thing you've got to do is you know pick the vendor that you're going to be most comfortable disagreeing and complaining about uh, for the next 10 years uh, you know in other words a, a, a vendor that is going to be responsive to your needs because these systems are not perfect and because you you know, and and the other thing is don't customize them unless you have to avoid all customizations at great length uh, and you know chapters will always say oh we want this we want that and you've got to be strong and resist um, customization um, because you want to stay on the upgrade path you want to be able to, to 
you know, as changes come about in the future, and they inevitably will, you want to make the the ability to to change very very easy on yourself. So, uh, pick a good vendor that you can work with, and I and I say it kiddingly, you know, that you're going to be able to disagree with. Uh, and, and and complain with because it's the nature of the beast. So pick one that's going to be responsive to you. Pick one that has a good um, track record in working with uh, associations of your size and scope. Very important. And then uh, you know we had the benefit we used for for all these projects, technology projects. We used outside consultants to help us uh, with the RFP process and the selection process. And the implementation process, because um, we don't, you know, while we have good technical, you know, uh, uh, one good technical staff person and you know staff that understand what our chapters want, we don't have the depth of expertise that's required now, you know. Um, so, you know, uh, utilize good consultants. Uh, be prepared to have uh, really in-depth conversations and. Bring the chapter folk, you know, into the conversation. Um, it's um, it's critical to not only get their ideas, but to get their buy-in ultimately to the product. Wow, well, a lot of uh, amazing nuggets in there for everyone to take notes right now. Um, and and so to wrap up the technology infrastructure, uh, a couple of key themes is uh, Gary, how did you how did you pay for all this? What was the chapters? Uh, what were their role in in terms of the cost? And they talked to us about the processing infrastructure. We actually had a couple people ask about the email support for chapter staff. Okay. Uh, well, we we um, get a share of the dues revenue. Uh, it's uh, today it's I think one hundred ninety five dollars, and the chapter set the um, the total dues number. They can charge anything they want. Most of them are charging. Four hundred and fifty dollars or so. So, uh, and we get to we set our dues level. It had not been changed in several years, seven years, I think it was. Uh, and so we started to increase our dues. You know, twenty bucks a year, twenty five bucks a year. Uh, and we're now on a th every three year dues review process. Uh, uh, and we basically use all that dues revenue, uh, which. Couple million dollars, it's not you know billions, uh, to pay for the technology infrastructure um, and to uh, and the and the staffing. We also had built up reserves, and we built up reserves purposefully uh, to invest in the technology uh, infrastructure. So you know the organization truly is built on a uh, on a uh, service basis ser serving the chapters and uh, providing the backbone uh, for them uh, to be able to serve the members um, and you know so you know the convention has a, a great year we have a little bit of profit at the end of the year we bank it after a few years we get a little money in the bank we then invest it back into the to the operation so uh, and the, speaking of the processing um, we have mandatory dues processing, so that's part of the, that's a no, can't opt out of that at the chapter level. We collect all the dues, uh, we, and we handle all the renewals, uh, you know, which gives us some consistency in that process. Um, it, but chapters also may participate in the event processing uh, through our system, and the great bulk of them, I think 90% or something, 85% of our chapters, uh, voluntarily participate in that. And again, events are critical to this organization. Uh, so there's lots and lots of events. So most of our chapters participate in that. So members can pay for an event online through us. We rebate all that back to the chapters every couple of weeks. Um, so it's um, it's a great service to the chapters, uh, and it allows our members to have a consistent experience, uh, you know, as they as they sign up for events across the system. Hey, Gary. Uh, hmm? So let me ask you, why are the dues processing mandatory and why are the chapter events um, functionality, why is that voluntary? Uh, legacy reasons, you know, the, 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 it was critical that, you know, we have a, a common system for collecting the dues um, and um, to, to fund the operations of the, of the organization. Uh, events sort of came along later and when we um, actually launched the, fir the first uh, common website, the master websites in 09, we really didn't contemplate at that time um, 
making chapters um, participate in the event system, um, that kind of came along a little bit later as we started to better understand the needs of chapters. Um, and then also, you know, the legacy piece of this is that the chapter affiliation agreement was sort of sets out all this. That was done right bef uh, before I came aboard. Um, and so, you know, we didn't have the vision at that time to say everybody has to do their event processing through through us. And you know, some chapters had long-standing uh, agreements with other uh, vendors like Cvent, etc. And so um, they didn't want to change. And then some were managed. Uh, many were managed by association management companies that had their own systems as well. And so again, you know, it's a federated model, can't make them do anything. So, yeah. but you know, our, and our thing has been, frankly, we're going to build a good system. There's lots of benefits for you, including separation of, of uh, accounting, uh, you know, and we did have a couple of situations where uh, there were um, uh, monies missing at the chapter level um, f uh, because of poor accounting and, and other reasons. And so um, there were some, um, incentives for chapters to be able to push the bulk of their revenues through us. Uh, we have a great accounting team led by, by John Lachlan and, and Laura Cooper, so um, we've built a pretty good system here and they've taken advantage of it. Great. And so we just got a couple of questions I want to touch on here real quick. Um, Gary, I'm not sure if you guys use one. We have a partner that does this, uh, but Olivia asked, uh, in reviewing the services provided to chapters, she saw that a chapter of the year award is managed. By any chance, do you have any suggestions for a great online awards vendor? A great online awards vendor? No, we don't use one of those. Uh, our chapter of the year uh, program is um, actually, you know, we should have probably talked about that in this thing, uh, in this webinar. Um, we, we give three of them away, large, medium, and small size chapters based on membership. Um, and uh, I'll, the, the, the awards process uh, here is very data driven, actually. Chapters do a self-assessment. Their score is used as part of the awards program. And they do a self-assessment based on key um, uh, aspects of uh, of um, best practices in association management, you know, do you have two signatures on your uh, on your checking account? Uh, do you have a a, a, a board with uh, you know uh, term limits and that sort of thing? So there's a whole list, but they set their own score, so that goes into the process, and then we look at uh, membership retention, membership growth, uh, re re the ratio of reserves uh, to their budget and other financial uh, factors, but it's all data driven. Uh, and then uh, the third key aspect is uh, have they uh, participated in the community? Are they attending the uh, various co uh, conference calls and chapter leadership meetings and that sort of thing? Because uh, we think that that's critical to the ultimate success of the chapters. And so uh, those are the three major areas um, that are assessed. And so really it does, it's, it's not necessarily something that would uh, uh, align itself with an online uh, award system. They don't apply uh, for the for the award necessarily. It's something gotcha. that through an analysis process with our chapter team. Great. Yeah, we keep seeing that as a repeated theme. So if you don't have a chapter awards kind of process, um, that's something we're seeing more and more across successful associations. And Olivia, there is one if um, you're looking to roll out awards to a mass group like your members, we see a few associations that we work with use Open Water, and that's uh, get, G-E-T, openwater.com, okay? Um, so one more question here on this slide, Gary, before we move on to the next section, and this comes from Ben. So does Global handle email for the chapters as well? Can you talk to us about the email support? Yeah, yeah, we uh, we do that. Um, of course, chapters don't necessarily have to use the system, but uh, we use uh, Constant Contact, um, and uh, we do have a central email server um, for the chapter staff, and most of them use 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 that. Um, uh, and you know, it's been pretty 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 good. And you know, again, in, in this day and age, when um, uh, security, cybersecurity is so important. Um, 
uh, you know, we by by working together with all the chapters, we can provide a level of sophistication uh, on both uh, the attributes of of good email uh, systems and also cybersecurity that uh, perhaps individual chapters couldn't couldn't do on their own. Awesome. Ben, let us let us know if that answered your question. That's a really important one. Um, and then there comes a question here from uh, I believe it came from Mark. Are so obviously in your name it's global. Are dues collected in other currencies, and if so, how? This is always a huge question when it comes to uh, chapter or chapter based systems that have uh, branches outside of the U.S. Yeah, and it's um, it is n uh, not easy at all. It's very very complicated, um, and um, you know the um, we collect um, and we we and we've sort of answered this in by bifurcating it to some degree. Dues from uh, Canada and the United States are done online, uh, and Canadian uh, dues are paid for in Canadian dollars. Um, there's a there's a back end banking system that routes all of this through Canadian banks. Um, uh, so that we can properly account for it and pay VAT and all that kind of stuff, um, but we collect in, in Canadian dollars there. The chapters outside the United States in uh, ten European countries and in China and Hong Kong, uh, we do that entirely differently. And again, this is uh, much much of this is driven by the way those chapters were set up years and decades ago. Uh, we bill them once a year at the beginning of the year. Um, to the we send a bill to the chapter based on how many members they say they have, and they give us a list, and we take their word for it. And uh, they are charged a fraction of what uh, U.S. and Canadian members are charged uh, because uh, they receive, um, uh, frankly, less overall support. Um, uh, than the other chapters do, although they do get the website and the AMS and all that business. Um, but uh, it's been it's a legacy uh, way to do it, and they all pay. You know the Euro European Union, it's, it's easy. Uh, they all pay the same euro currency, and uh, in a UK in pounds sterling, of course, and Brazil in you know, reals or whatever, and then uh, the. China and in, uh, in the Remimbi. So yeah, it's all done in local currency and set differently. Great, Mark. Let us know if you have any follow-up questions there. So moving right along uh, to section two. So uh, let's talk about capacity building. And Gary, what do you mean by capacity building? So you know, ultimately, going back, the, the chapters are the frontline providers of service to our members and customers, and we serve ninety thousand people a year. They do twelve hundred events a year. Some of the some of the events they they do are uh, Capital Connections get you know fifteen hundred people. Um, so uh, our our goal early on was to find a way or find ways to improve the performance of chapters. Uh, and, and and their ability to serve members and do a better job of, of representing the brand um, and grow the organization and so we we did that by uh, really trying to grow the professionalism of, of our chapter executives uh, grow the um, strategic capabilities of our chapter boards um, and provide them with the services they need to better address the changing world, uh, you know, the changing needs of our members. Uh, so, so if you're a CRP right now, and if you're looking at the slide, this is the kind of stuff you want to write down as you're pitching it to your to your senior leadership, um, and use this as a resource for what Gary has created. Uh, you guys aren't making this out uh, or up out of thin air. This is things that have already been implemented. So this is something that, or even just a, a chunk of what you're trying to accomplish this year um, with your New Year's resolutions. This is the kind of stuff you want to reference. Uh, and, and Gary, one of the when I asked that question earlier in the webinar, one of the top uh, uh, one of the top pieces of feedback we got was around how the strategic plans are not aligned between HQ and uh, their chapters. So walk us through in a federated model, how do you get these local chapters that are so federated and, and can operate on their own, how do you get them aligned to the, the national organization's strategic objectives? Well, um, a lot of it is, 
education and communication and consistency of branding. We do have a, tr a really professional um, uh, uh, guidelines for how to, how to use the logo and the name. And we, at Global, we own the trademarks and we have the authority to police the use of all of our trademarks and our logos. And uh, we are vigilant in doing that in part because we have had situations where uh, outsiders have appropriated or tried to appropriate trademarks and service marks um, to uh, you know, uh, do business with our members uh, and try to represent themselves in, in a way connected to the organization and, and they weren't. So we, by, um, by uh, policing those, were able to uh, you know, stop that kind of kind of thing. So we're able to do it that way. And then, uh, you know, on strategic, a lot of it is also through our strategic planning, communicating what we're doing, uh, involving the chapters in our strategic planning, uh, listening to their needs. But then also, really, at the heart of it, the thing that moves the needle the most is, frankly, um, Leslie Wittet and I and, and other members of my team. We will consult free of charge to our chapters. Um, I, I'm going uh, in a couple of weeks to our Dallas-Fort Worth chapter for the third time in the last six or seven years. Uh, I I lead a, a facilitative process, to, you know, for about six hours uh, with the chapter board and staff. And Leslie uh, joins that as a as the resource person, and she takes the lead in facilitating some of these. If I can't do it, um, and um, it is a plan that they develop, that uh, every word of it, every word of every goal is their words and, and their goals. But in doing this process, and we're very careful not to impose our own views. We're very careful not to say you know you must or you should. We but we're there and we educate and they ask us questions. How do other chapters do this? And what do you think about this? And what's your advice? So we 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 give them the opportunity to uh, access us um, and to learn from the community as a whole. And it sh it shapes alignment over time. It's not something that's going to be you know tomorrow everyone's going to be on the same page. That's not how it happens. Um, but that's the that's the best we can do given our circumstance, and I will tell you, it has made a world of difference. Frank, awesome. And so, the, the, to wrap up this section for capacity building, uh, you have a couple of awesome nuggets in here. Talk to us about what is your professional development fund that you have for your chapters. So uh, Leslie and I are both like committed association executive professionals. We're both CAEs. We're both you know active in ASAE, uh, and we both came to this task uh, 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 understanding that um, you know we have 130 chapter executives, uh, uh, various uh, levels of co competency and experience. Uh, some of our chapter executives have been in place for 20, 25 years. Uh, it's not unusual to have a chapter executive in, in place for 5, 10, 15 years. Um, but most of them um, have not had the same opportunities for professional development as we have had. And one of the things that we know from simple, simple analysis is the most successful chapters are those with the most experienced, qualified, and uh, trained chapter staff. And so we wanted to put together uh, systems and, and and processes that supported uh, the development of good chapter staff. So we created a professional professional development fund, uh, and and we ask the boards to match our uh, our grant. But a chapter executive can uh, ask for a grant of up to seven hundred and fifty dollars annually to go to uh, educational programs to get their CAE designation to to do anything that develops their skills and abilities. And we ask the chapter boards to match it because we want the boards to see their chapter executives as professionals who are deserving and needful of training and development. Wow, I want to put emphasis on this because I haven't ran across this too much, Gary. Um, and I'd be curious, if everyone could type into the chat, do you, does your association at National, do you guys have any kind of program like this? 
because this is super interesting to me in terms of aligning your chapters with HQ. If you get the leader of those chapters on board and you're educating them and furthering their careers, um, Gary, I'll ask you, my guess would be that they're going to be much more willing to work with National in that case because you're furthering their personal and professional life. Um, have you seen great success with that? Uh, absolutely, and you, you know, we we try very much to you know treat them uh, with respect um, and uh, appreciation. We have a chapter executive of the year award um, that we that uh, I basically personally select with Leslie's uh, advice, um, and uh, we're we're very keen about raising the profile and the importance of chapter executives with within ACG and. Um, we also try very hard to find ways to make their lives easier, and and um, because ACG has been sort of growing, uh, you know, we've chapters in the last decade have started to really hire uh, higher level professionals, and if you have a staff of one or two or three, you know, it's a pain to get payroll and get their health care and you know all that kind of stuff in place. It's very complex, especially on healthcare these days. So um, one of the things that we've developed is a payroll and HR services package to support our chapter um, uh, executives. And um, I, I don't, you, many of your folks on, on, on the call may have heard of Insperity. They're a professional employer organization. There are several companies that do this. Um, my team here at Global is all on the Insperity program. They provide the payroll services. They provide the health care, uh, you know, insurance, uh, you know, workers' comp, all that kind of stuff. They handle all that, sort of our HR department, if you will. So we offer that as a pass-through service to our chapters who have executives that um, that they want to retain that and, and they want to have 401ks and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we now have about a dozen or so chapters, again, all voluntary. Uh, they tend to be the uh, higher compensated, uh, but frankly, we also have junior staff as well. But it's a great service. And again, uh, this, is a, this is about um, helping chapters attract and retain quality talent. And um, frankly, there's a huge benefit to us, and and, that, and we don't make a nickel on this. We 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 uh, the chapters pay 100% of the cost of this. We don't make a nickel. In fact, it probably costs us in terms of you know, service, but it helps knit the organization together. Because if you're a chapter executive and you're getting a paycheck every two weeks, and you have a 401k, and you've got great health care benefits. It's much harder for you to go. You know that national bunch, global. They're you know they don't do anything for me. We're taking. We're going to go local. We're going to you know quit the organization. They have a great incentive to stick with the organization and to help the organization become better. Great. And so this next slide, talking about capacity building, is something we preach all the time, and we call it working groups, but it's a cadence with your chapter executives, and you take it one step further, Gary, to talk to us about the cadence you have uh, with these calls uh, with your executives and chapter boards. Uh, Leslie and, and her team do, oh, gosh, 30 or 40 uh, you know, uh, of these uh, calls a year. We have uh, regular calls with uh, any chapter executive um, conference calls, um, uh, all of our chapter executives. Uh, and they deal with you know what's happening out there, program ideas, issues, uh, you know, you you name it. Uh, and we and uh, we listen to what topics that they want us to address. Um, and we do the same with chapter boards. Um, and it's all about again that whole getting them out of isolation, making sure that they are they they know they're part of something bigger, that they're um, uh, that they have um, others who have done who have addressed every single problem that they have addressed. Um, and uh, so it's reducing that isolation, connecting them with each other, uh, and frankly, you know, helping them uh, ha get better ideas to better serve their, their members. Great. All right, so this is the last section here, everyone. So I, I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. Yes. Um, let, let's talk about global and chapter alignment. Uh, obviously, this is kind of an underlying theme here, Gary. But the adoption of a strategic plan, uh, gosh, this is, I, I can see everybody um, shaking their head up and down when I, I say this.
but the adoption of a strategic plan informed by member needs assessments. So understanding at the end of the day that all of this has to improve the member's life and it, it, it will be so much more successful that way. And enabled by participation by chapter leaders. Gosh, I think that is probably the most important sentence that I said this year, uh, quite frankly, but probably all of last year. Um, talk to us about what you mean um, when you say this and, and, and why do you give it so much emphasis? Well, we, we, we want the whole organization, all the key organization stakeholders, the chapter leaders and chapter executives and the global board to understand the uh, importance of strategy and long-term thinking for the whole organization, that we're not lurching from event to event, from month to month or from year to year. And so, you know, we um, place a lot of emphasis at the global level on strategic planning. We uh, hire outside consultants to help us gather uh, member uh, assessment, you know, surveys and focus groups, et cetera, um, uh, and then and we very much listen to that. We facilitate uh, gatherings of chapter executives and and uh, leaders and ask them, you know, what what's happening? What do they what do they want us to do? What how is the world changing? How is our industry changing? You know, what should we do? Uh, and and get them to think five and ten years uh, in advance before they you know before they give us that advice. And then we kind of mush it all together in a facilitated process with the with the, a subset of the global board and with representation of, of chapters and, and that sort of thing. And we create a, a strategic plan that's you know very frankly very simple, uh, but it's clear and concise. And uh, we use that plan at the global level to drive our annual plan of work. Uh, in other words, what we're doing as a staff and then that plan of work drives the annual budgeting process. So, and then that plan helps to inform um, the planning processes when we go and work with chapters. And so, for for example, um, I, I mentioned early on in this conversation that we had you didn't have a unifying mission statement uh, eight years ago. Uh, we adopted, a, and we went from a 56-word mission statement to a two-and-a-half-word mission statement or three-word mission statement, driving middle market growth. <clears throat> and we did that because it, middle market uh, seemed to be the most unifying thing that we could come up with, frankly. Um, and um, at first, you know, some chapters said, oh, no, no, that's, you know, we, we want to talk about big companies, you know, that's, you know, exclusionary, but we said, well, it's, it's not, and we kind of explained it, and so, again, can't make anybody do anything, but long, long, short, the long short of it is now the great bulk of our chapters um, have something along the same lines. It's never exactly the same, or very rarely, but it typically includes the middle market, you know, that sort of thing. So, we're, we're getting there, and the chapters that don't have that exact phrase or something like it aren't very far from it, frankly. And so we're we're all we're closer and closer and closer to having a unified mission. And real quick, I got a couple of great questions on this from Diana and John. So Diana asked, "Does each chapter's board get quarterly calls with Global, or do you have all of those boards on one call?" They're all on one call because we have 59 chapters. Great. Right. And so, then John John asked. Uh, what, who hosts the quarterly calls? Is it the CRP um, at, at your organization, or yes. are you on there? Okay, great. Yeah, so it's a CRP. Uh, usually, I don't participate unless they they ask me to. And um, uh, Leslie and her team um, uh, figure out what the what the agenda is, the topics are going to be. They recruit the speakers. It's usually, frankly, it's usually a chapter leader or chapter executive saying, "Hey, this is what we did. This is what worked. This is." how it didn't work, this is what we learned, uh, and then we let people ask them questions. Great. All right. So a couple of big topics when it comes to aligning the chapters is the affiliation agreements and chapter standards, as well as kind of the communication suite that exists. Uh, talk to us about what ACG has done and uh, what you would recommend other associations uh, to definitely concentrate on when it comes to these two topics. 
Well, you know, the affiliation agreement uh, was done very early on. It took us three years to get all the chapter boards signed on to this uh, because we have lots of lawyers in ACG's membership, and every board has at least two lawyers, and so therefore every board's lawyers had to have some slight change. So it took a while, um, but we did get everybody to sign on to a chapter affiliation agreement that really basically says, Global is going to do these things. So we're going to give you a website. We're going to collect the dues. We're going to do, you know, and then chapter is supposed to do this, you know, and, and these are our rights and responsibilities, that sort of thing. And we have the global, the global owns the URLs and the domains and the trademarks, and we license them to the chapters. And but the chapters agree to, you know, abide by certain standards, brand standards, etc. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, and then we, we later uh, adopted a, a minimum uh, uh, chapter standards, which are really pretty pretty minimum, uh, but they're effective um, for us in the sense that it gives us a tool uh, when we have underperforming chapters to go in and say, you know, you're autonomous and independent and all that, but we have these standards, and if you're not doing at least these things, uh, then we have the ability to, you know, say goodbye, and you guys will close you up and re rescind the licensing agreements and all that. And it's been an effective tool for us to to be able to cause change when uh, all other uh, um, options have been exhausted. Great. And so here's our last slide, folks. And I know we're hitting the top of the hour here, but um, obviously public policy involvement in, in, is such a huge component when it comes to associations. Um, how did ACG set it up when you guys realigned your strategy with the chapters? Well, uh, uh, the, uh, ACG had never been engaged with public policy uh, at all. In fact, uh, had been it was prohibited in our bylaws from doing it, even though we are a 501c6 organization. So, long, long, long story of it is. Uh, we began a dialogue with the global board about uh, whether or not we should be involved, made the decision to get involved in advocacy in sort of a light way uh, in, in 2010, uh, got involved with it, had some really good successes representing the organization and the industry, um, and then decided to put more resources into it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, I, and again, it's one of these things where chapters come along slowly at first and then they start to build engagement um, and now we have a uh, we have a uh, office in Washington DC with two full-time people um, we've, we've had some great successes in with the Securities and Exchange Commission and in Congress um, and you know we're now we have a whole group of chapters who are voluntarily writing very significant checks way above dues um, uh, to help support the, the, the effort. They're going up to the hill with us on visits. They, they participate in a public policy summit in Washington every year. And, and, the, and, the, good, and the great thing about this is, is this is an effort that only global can do and lead, but it totally requires the buy-in by chapters because the members of Congress are local, and so chapters uh, get engaged in in helping members of Congress with plant tours, touring facilities and manufacturing plants and the sites of our member businesses. Um, so it's a great way for chapters to be engaged with local uh, office holders um, and, um, and it adds to the success and to the, to the safety and security and growth of the, of the, of the organization and profession. Awesome, Gary. Well, I, I want to be respectful of your time and, and everyone else is here. So uh, if you have more questions, send them in and, and we'll do our best to get those to answer. But uh, Gary, just to wrap up today, I'm, I'm going to ask you to put on, uh, I'll call it your, your Tony Robbins hat and, and give us a, a little bit of insight into tackling a monumental, I think sometimes it seems, challenge uh, such as you did when you realigned the chapters. Um, what is your best advice in a few sentences that you, you would give to a CRP that's uh, listening to you today? I think you have to look at this um, as a developmental process. Uh, you know, you, you, you can't impose anything from above. I've learned that for sure. Um, you have to look at this in the context of um, the, the learning needs of, of the 
chapter leaders and board members. You have to look at this in terms of uh, you know the strategy, getting the strategy as aligned as possible. Um, but understand that you know boards, uh, chapter boards will come along in their time if they see you as truly being on their side and wanting the same things that that, that you're truly aligned with their values um, of serving members and improving their standing as, a, as an organization and being a partner with them is is absolutely critical and uh, you, you can't look at it as a parent-child relationship I mean when I, I started in association management 36 years ago in an organization that had uh, 300 chapters and uh, later was my first CEO job was an organization with 1500 chapters and in both of those organizations it was much more of a top-down parent-child relationship um, in a professional organization a professional society um, in particular uh, that that model does not work it's a partnership uh, and a servant leadership kind of relationship much more than than a parent-child uh, well, Gary, you dropped some, some great knowledge on us today. Um, we still have a bunch of, of things that I, I know that people want to go over, but I, I just want to say on behalf of the audience and, and ourselves, uh, we really do appreciate the, the time that you've dedicated to this. And folks, it wasn't just this hour. Uh, it's been several uh, getting set up for today and, and making sure we had the content right um, to address what you guys have been asking us. So, Gary, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, good luck to everybody out there. And have a great year, everybody. Awesome. And for everyone that has asked, yes, this absolutely is recorded. We'll get that edited and out in the next couple of days, which will be on our website, uh, as well as the slides will be available on SlideShare. So both of those are available, as are all our webinars. This is going to be a continuing conversation around aligning HQ and chapters. You, We love bringing you examples of what just can happen and transform your association and add more value and impact to the members when you appropriately do it. So we appreciate Gary and, and all the hard work he's doing um, and, and look forward to continuing the conversation throughout the year. Happy New Year. I hope your resolutions are still intact five days in. Um, I know that mine are not already, <laughs> but I will, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow is another opportunity to get back on the horse. So thanks a lot, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.